There's a video I like to show when I teach this lesson to students. It gets their attention and is a humorous way of getting to an obvious but important point regarding fiction and the lesson at hand. The scene looks like this. A man is standing on a 20-foot ladder about 10 feet off the ground. He's holding a chainsaw. The ladder is leaning against a tree. The man, almost unbelievably, proceeds to saw down the tree on which his ladder is propped. I suspect I enjoy playing this video more than my students enjoy watching it, because I get to see their reactions, which are instantaneous and vary from hands on heads to raised eyebrows to, oh my god, how could anybody possibly be that dumb, to a subtle devilish grin from the odd rascal in the group. The video is about a minute long, and the rising level of suspense as this guy whomps away at the tree with his chainsaw is amazing, until, inevitably, the trunk begins to list, the ladder begins to fall, and man and chainsaw go tumbling into a heap as the trunk comes crashing to the ground. The man gets up, unharmed after a few seconds, in case you are concerned. A bump to his pride and a video memorialization of his not-so-finest hour are the only real wounds. The point is this, from the second everyone in my class sees that scenario, they know what's going to happen. Predictive inference is at the heart of our ability to process fiction. People can visualize the outcome of a scenario like this, and we're so good at making inferences that by the second people see the setup of that clip, they know the outcome. It's a rare cognitive feat in the animal kingdom, though. Chimps and dolphins do it to a much smaller degree, and perhaps octopi and cuttlefish but few others. Humans see the possible future with that falling ladder so clearly that it creates a visceral emotional response, that anticipatory cringe we all know so well. Today we're not talking falling ladders, but we are talking possible futures, modal universes in geek speak. They're what we're constructing as we process a story. Most of the time they're not as clear as man on ladder takes chainsaw to tree, but this concrete illustration is a good place to start. A modal universe is what allows us to plan for the future, chart a course, and realize a possible outcome. As avatars of human agents and story worlds, our characters are going to need to do this too, and as writers, if we get this right, it's an excellent way to create magnetic suspense throughout the course of our stories. This is at the heart of what makes our representations of people in the story world seem real to our readers. So how do we do this? Possible worlds theory goes back several decades in both cognitive science and narrative theory, and it has implications for characters in this case that would go something like this. A character, like a person, has multiple facets to their personality. Some will be consonant, some will conflict. Inevitably, some facet of their personality will desire to change the state of their story world to a more desired state. Hungry Juby wants to become banana-eating Juby, and in the fastest possible way, for example. This simple framework for thinking about character knowledge and motivation is at the heart of possible worlds theory, and it's a useful way to approach two of the most magnetic plot elements, dilemma and conflict. Knowledge worlds. To start, in order for a character to have a desire to change their world, they have to have ideas about their world. Every character, just like every person, has their own unique set of knowledge about the world they inhabit. They have beliefs, assumptions, theories, and hard knowledge about their surroundings. A detective in a mystery story, for example, probably has a lot of useful knowledge about how to solve a murder based on experience. What that detective needs to lack for the story to have any suspense is the identity of the murderer. These two things, what a character knows and what they don't know, delineate the border of their knowledge world. This is the baseline, the status quo. The knowledge world of a character matters because this is the framework they use to act in their world. To use the example of Juby again, there are several important pieces of knowledge the reader must have in order to understand Juby's actions as a character. Primary among these is that he's hungry and injured. He also believes that the two larger male chimps don't like him and will hurt him if he tries to get food. He's unsure about the others. He doesn't know any other source of food that's readily available. He seems to think that his best chance for survival is to stay with this group and to see how it plays out. 
That's what he knows according to the textual account that is presented to the reader. This is a character's knowledge world. Wish worlds. The future a character desires to bring about is called a wish world. This is Juby stuffed with bananas and injury-free, probably getting on fairly well as a fully accepted member of the group. Characters' wish worlds can also be thought of as goals, and these need to be either implicit in the text or stated clearly for the reader to understand what the character's goal is. One of the commonest refrains in fiction workshops is the statement, I don't know what this character wants. If you've heard that before or uttered it, it's because a character's wish world wasn't properly conveyed by the textual cues. The wish world is what keys readers into a character's motivation for acting. This is generally easy in stories that revolve around danger or wealth, because it's safe to assume the character doesn't want to be hurt and would love to be famously wealthy. Who wouldn't? In a story about adultery, perhaps, the motivation for straying won't be implicitly obvious, and the reader may need some textual cues in order to begin to understand the character's behavior. Obligation Worlds As avatars of people, characters inherit our baggage. If a character is a rocket scientist, that character is going to know a lot of cool things about rockets and probably make a nice living for it. But when 7 o'clock rolls around, that character is going to have to roll out of bed and go to work, just like the rest of us. Characters have obligations, too. The character's obligation world represents the set of obligation that goes along with the life the author envisions for that character. If he's a father, he must take care of his children. If she's a judge, she must file paperwork and show up for work on time. These obligations involve things like following the implicit rules of the culture as well. Not shouting at random strangers at a bus stop, for example, or not throwing snowballs at cops, things like that. Plots start to get interesting when different parts of characters' worlds come into conflict. Good stories start here. A small tension between an obligation and a wish world might be, company policy is that Audrey is supposed to be at her desk from 9 to 12 every weekday, but a friend she hasn't seen since college has invited her to coffee at 10.30 on Tuesday. Does Audrey duck out for a few minutes? A big tension might be, Thomas is married and has a new colleague at the office who has been paying obvious attention to him. Thomas finds this new colleague very attractive. They go for drinks after work and flirt. There's a hotel across the street from the bar. That sort of thing. Bringing characters' conflicting inner worlds into opposition is the root of suspense in dilemma and conflict narratives. Theoretically, a character could have any number of infinite worlds that come into conflict. Fantasy worlds and pretend worlds are two examples. But the primary suspense and dilemmas and conflicts almost always comes from clashes of wish worlds and obligation worlds. Dilemmas A good dilemma usually stems from a conflict between a wish and an obligation, though sometimes a clash between two wishes or two obligations can be just as powerful. The key to crafting a good dilemma is a fair balance between two options that necessarily oppose one another. The more a character has to gain or lose, the higher the suspense will be. Here's an example. Andre is a starting linebacker at a prominent college football program that just won their conference championship. The day after their bowl game, he sees a banned supplement in the backup nose tackle's gym bag. The nose tackle, Scott, only played a handful of snaps in the championship game and none of them made a noticeable impact on the outcome, which the team won by a fair margin. Andre knows that reporting his teammate may result in the forfeiture of the conference championship, resulting in a substantial loss of money and prestige to the program. He believes this will alienate him from his teammates and result in blowback from the entire coaching staff. Andre is deeply Christian, though, and believes that remaining silent about Scott's cheating would constitute a significant sin. There's a lot to lose here, including his starting position the following year, and maybe even an opportunity to play at the professional level. Who knows how scouts will view a whistleblower? Probably not well. Not to mention that his teammates are his only social support system at the university. How does Andre negotiate this minefield, playing out this tension between two possible worlds inside the psyche of a single character, is what makes a dilemma narrative so magnetically compelling. The reader gets a free pass at a highly complex social scenario with no obvious right or wrong answer, and potentially tremendous repercussions on either end. You may think you know how Andre should act, 
but so much of what is difficult with dilemmas can be unforeseen. The reader gets to play out the scenario by walking in Andre's shoes. A free pass at hashing out a narrative dilemma without consequences is a compelling narrative game that readers generally jump at the opportunity to play if it's well crafted and the stakes are high for the character. How Andre acts will ultimately shape how a reader feels about this character. Is he a forthright hero, a snitch, or a do gooder out to draw attention to himself? Is he all three? Conflict. Whether between individuals, groups, or nations, conflict follows a similar model. The conflicting motivation of opposing wish worlds clash, only instead of the psyche of a single character, two or more characters play at this game. The added dimension here is that the characters can take action to influence the behavior of the other parties. Andre, for instance, learns that Zack, one of the team captains, knows about Scott, too. Zack has a sense that Andre's going to blow the whistle, and he's not happy about the prospects of having his conference title stripped. That title is what Zack has worked toward his entire life. Over a backup nose tackle? Andre gets back to his off-campus apartment one night to find his tire slashed, and a single word scrawled in chalk on his windshield. Don't. Now we've got a conflict. These two guys want totally different things, and only one of them will get to see their wish fulfilled. The suspense in the plot comes from watching these two parties work to bring their opposing future wish worlds into being. Dilemmas and conflicts are two prominent ways that character and plot are hopelessly intertwined. The situations and stories that I've generated here are designed to be simple, to illustrate the points being covered in the clearest possible manner. Even so, complexity arises. Some of the most compelling and famous literary stories aren't drawn much more subtly than my example here. Other inter-character conflicts are remarkably subtle, as though sometimes the characters themselves may not clearly understand why they're acting the way they are. Thinking about your character's inner worlds, especially in a narrative whose plot is centered around dilemma or conflict, will give you a framework for drawing your reader into their suspenseful struggle. These two magnetic elements represent the ultimate in the psychological unknown, mediating the gray area between right and wrong and all the consequences that go with that, and that will make for one hell of a story. Addendum. It's worth saying a few words here on epiphanies. Though not quite as in vogue these days as they once were, literary epiphanies were all but a requirement for characters in literary stories during the early to mid-20th century. What constitutes an epiphany hasn't ever been all that well defined, although one decent definition from a prominent craft guide goes as follows. A character is brought or forced into a state of enlightenment, experiencing a moment when he or she realizes something of great importance to his or her life. I've found it useful to think of epiphanies as an action or happening in the story world that shifts the fundamental layers of a character's knowledge world. They learn something of which they were totally unaware that shifts their self-identity or their major framework for viewing the world. I mention it here because the knowledge world is a good way to approach this concept. Oh,